generation. So they wanted me to talk to you about the greatest generation, the Jewish generation, and Peter Mansbridge, who you may have heard of, even called my book very important because he said it's important that we bring these stories of these brave Canadians out of the shadows and out of the graves where they lie and tombstones in all corners of the uh, globe. And it's important to give a voice, not just to the 450 who didn't come home, but also for the rest of the 17,000 Canadians of Jewish faith who mostly chose not to talk about the war when they came back. I don't know if anyone here, and I can't really see, but I'm gonna ask you anyway for a show of hands. Does anyone in this audience have a veteran in their family? Can you show me? Raise your hands. One, a couple of you. Thank you for your service. Did they talk about it? When, when they came back? Did they talk about it to you and to the grandchildren? My nine did not. My father-in-law told me that he slept through the blitz and uh, played soccer, which we of course know it isn't true. And, but in doing the hundreds of interviews that I did for this book, I was able to unearth stories that they've never told their kids or their grandchildren. Um, and I found out the stories of the sacrifice and the courage that your grandparents and great-grandparents and uncles and cousins and your, some of your aunts as well who served, maybe mothers who served, they hadn't told anyone because I dug deep and I listened hard. And I was so privileged to be able to interview um, people such as Monty Hall and before he died, his real name is Monty Halperin, but Monty Hall and uh, also Monty Quinter whose uh, cousin was killed. And I also interviewed David Steinberg, who was a comedian, and his brother was killed, Jaime, and David Kroll, who I think was an honoree in previous generations of the Book of Life. Um, and the, I didn't interview him, I interviewed his daughter. And I interviewed um, or spoke to people in the uh, Wayne and Schuster family, who also served. These are Canadian comedians, and for those of you who are of a certain generation will remember them, but some of you may not. They were overseas. And I spoke to the Rabovsky family and the Ladovsky family. And all of these people will also ring a bell because they were honorees. And also Connie Monson Kusner, there you are and I meeting for the first time when I spoke about your brother, Rabbi David Monson, who was uh, one of the 16 Canadian Jewish chaplains appointed to serve and minister to the Jewish boys and women who served in World War II while they were training here in Canada. And then he went overseas with them right onto the front lines. Do you know how her brother used to get the Jewish boys to come to services on the base in Canada before they went overseas? Now they had to go on Sunday because the military called it Hebrew church parade. I know, I know. So what he used to do to get them to come to shul, maybe the rabbis could figure this out now, is he would hand out delicacies, oranges, and mini salamis, mini wursts, to all the boys that would come. And the non-Jewish boys in the, bar in the barracks started to hear about this, and they started to sneak in too. And he never discriminated, they got it too. But before leaving Camp Borden, up near Barry, for going overseas in England in 1943, Rabbi Monson had to stamp out an incident of anti-Semitism. There was a hotel near the base that had a sign up that said, no Jews or dogs allowed. And Rabbi Monson rounded up some strong young Jewish men in uniform from the base and he headed over to the proprietor of this hotel and he said to him, these are my boys and we're going overseas to fight for your freedom but we're gonna start right here, right now. That sign, it's coming down. Because if it isn't, I can't be responsible for what my boys might do. And the sign came down and was never replaced. Now, there's a sign like that from Peterborough. It wasn't just in Barrie, it was everywhere. Now you might think this gentleman, Mackenzie King, who's sort of like Haman for us, right? Uh, would it be thrilled that 17,000 eager, motivated Jewish recruits would be flocking to the armories to try to go over and enlist. But you would be wrong. Canada in 1939 was a country where 
The Jewish boys had to have their own recruiting offices. This is Montreal, but they had one on Beverly Street in Toronto because the military wasn't making it easy for Jews to sign up. There were regiments that were not taking Jews, so they had to have people to sort of help them with the paperwork and know which one to go. Canada was a country of the MS St. Louis. Canada was a country of none is too many. Canada was a country of the Christy Pitts riots where Jews could not get jobs um, on corporate boards. There were country clubs that were off limits to Jews and so on and so on. And another one of your honorees told me about the restrictive covenants in Lawrence Park and in East York where you couldn't buy property if you were Jewish. This is Hamilton, Westdale. Now, David Kroll, he's seen here on the left in the suit with the King and Queen of England in 1939 visiting Windsor because he was the mayor. He had to go and enlist in 1939. Okay, he's a little old, no, to be in the army, but, and he had three daughters. But the Jewish boys of, of Windsor came to him and said, Sir, Essex Scottish, they're not allowing us to enlist. So he called up the Windsor newspaper, said, send a photographer down to the armories. And then he marched down and he enlisted as a private. They paid him $1.30 a day. His wife was not amused. She said, are you crazy? We have three daughters. How are we going to live on $1.30 a day? But Private Kroll wanted to set an example, not only for the Jewish boys to enlist, but to show Canadians that Canadian Jews were loyal and they were going to the pointy end of the stick to go and stop Hitler. His commanding officer made him clean the latrines. Now, it wasn't easy for him to sign up, but other Jewish people that signed up also had to face anti-Semitism even in the interview section of their uh, recruiting um, interview. You would see the very first thing that the officers would write down is their religion. And then they would talk about how amazing this guy is from Hamilton, he's going to be a great pilot. And then they used this language which anyone in HR today would know you'd be fired in a minute, will be rather pushing. Right? And all this coded anti-Semitic language. Now, if you were a woman, it was I'll even take worse. One Sorry. I'm Can really we bothered. Okay. I also want to tell you that if you were already in and you were lucky enough to get in as a Jew, you had to face anti-Semitism from the people wearing the same uniforms as you, right on the battlefield. This is Nathan Isaacs. Nathan was a navigator on a Halifax bomber doing bombing runs over Germany. And I asked him to describe the anti-Semitism he experienced over in England. I'll tell you one that uh, really bothered me a lot. This wasn't a training, this was while I, we were in operations. Oh, so the overseas already. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we'll get to yeah. that afterwards, uh, yeah. After I'd done probably a dozen raids and uh, we're sitting in, in the officer's wet canteen. What squadron was this? 427? 427, mm -hmm. yeah. And there was a bunch of guys sitting around drinking. And all of a sudden, one of the, one of the who was an officer pipes up, you know what we'll do? He says, after the war, we've got to take Hitler back to Canada with us so we can clean all Jews out of Canada. Yeah. Was he really drunk? He must, well, I don't know. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, I, I, I just, he was twice as big as me, so I... <laughs> So I, I, I just felt bad that I wasn't big enough to hit him over the head with a bottle or something. Now, did you, um, I also want to tell you that Jews who went told me that they went for a reason. This was their war, if it was anyone's war, they were going to stop Hitler and save their own people. Okay? And some of them were not ashamed to be wearing their Judaism on their dog tags and on their pay books, which they had to carry. But as David said, if you got caught by the Nazis with this stuff, you had a fate that was very dark indeed. So I asked Murray Jacobs, who uh, went overseas with the Royal Canadian Electrical Engineers, if he changed his dog tags. Oops. Now, did you have um, a dog tag? And did you put your Hebrew on it? Oh, yeah. Because some people chose not to do that, as you know. I don't believe in that. That's a bunch of crap. Okay? <laughs> because, first of all, if you're not proud of who you are, you shouldn't be there. That's what this was all about. There's guys in our outfit 
that had different denominations. They think that they're not going to find out that they were Jewish if they were found out. Come on. This is, you know, bubble mindsets. So they went, and they went overseas, and we're coming into the end of May. May. We just uh, commemorated VE Day, and the Canadians started to liberate Holland and Germany and the camps, and they came to the camps. And they came to Bergen-Belsen, and they helped the uh, survivors, and it marked them. And this is actual photos of a Canadian Jewish photographer who was in Belsen a day or two after it was liberated. Now, I want you to look at this picture, the sort of chunky guy on the top right. He's 19-year-old Jewish plumber from Montreal named Jack Markovich. What do you notice about this picture? Okay, he's holding a weapon, right? And who do you think the guy on the left is looking very kind of nervous? That is the, Bre the Beast of Belsen, Joseph Kramer, the Commandant. And Jack Markovich, a Canadian Jew, was going to kill him when they found out that he was trying to escape because look, there's no insignia on the uniform, right? He's trying to hide, he put on a private uniform, he took all the braids off and the medals, right? And the British guy at the top in the beret says, don't shoot him, take him, because they wanted to keep him for the war crimes trial, which he was eventually executed. Der Weg der Befreiung, ein Vormarsch in die Hölle. Am 15. April 1945 erreicht das britische 63. Panzerabwehrregiment Bergen-Belsen am Südrand der Lüneburger Heide. Der Lagerkommandant Josef Kramer und seine Bewachungsmannschaften werden überrascht und gefangen genommen. Die Briten wissen auch um die Vernichtungslager in Ordnung. Now he was so mad because a couple of months earlier, there he is on the left, he had already liberated another camp called Vukt. Vukt is in the south of Holland. It has a crematorium. And he got there and he found storerooms full of Jewish artifacts, sitters, taluses. And he wanted to save them all, but the CO, the commanding officer, said, we're on the move, we have to keep going to liberate more, take one. So Jack saved one sitter that belonged to a Dutch family that had been killed in Sobibor. I interviewed the son of Jack, and I asked him, tell me about this sitter that your father lovingly cared for and wrapped in velvet in his drawer in Ottawa all his life. And he opened it, and he said, oh, there's a name in it. And it said the name of who it belonged to. That gave me something to go on, and I found what happened to this family. So the sitter belonged to the Kahn family of Valkenburg. They were deported to uh, Sobibor and killed in 1943, way before the Canadians arrived. All the adult children, except for one, and the parents were killed. But one girl was put in a monastery, and she survived. And her daughter is named Elise. And she's named after her grandmother who was killed at Sobibor. And she's alive and well. There she is. And she lives in Holland. And I found her. And I introduced her to Jack's son, Don, by email. And I said to Elise, you're never going to believe this. She's not Jewish, right? Because her mother converted. She was in a monastery. We have a Canadian soldier has done such a holy thing that he has a replica. Uh, he has a remnant of your grandparents. The only legacy that they have left of the Holocaust. They lost their whole family except for one, and it's been lovingly cared for in Ottawa all these 72 years. And she was stunned and emotional. So I went to Holland, and I met her, and I brought pictures and a video of an interview with Dawn about this, and she was interested to find out more about her Jewish heritage, and she took me to the local synagogue to discover more. Now, the sad story is he's not giving it back yet. I'm working on it. He doesn't want to give it back. He feels it's his father. But she is so happy to know that there's some Canadian who did a holy thing. And she now has a legacy to pass on to her children and her generation from the Holocaust, thanks to a Canadian serviceman who did this. That's her and her son. Now, you said, David, so rightly, that if you talk about people who are dead 
and you remember them, then they're never forgotten. And I've been asking travelers who go outside of Canada, like you did, to visit the Jewish boys who are buried in far-flung places. Bring a stone, bring a pebble, bring a Yorkshire candle, say a prayer. I've done it myself. We sent people to Iceland, to Reykjavik, where David Steinberg's brother is buried. I've sent people to Hong Kong, and I've sent people to Ghana, Africa, to see the grave of Samuel Jacob Donan of Winnipeg. He was a menswear department manager from Oretsky's department store in Winnipeg. He signed up for the RCAF. He flew in ferry command, which is an extremely dangerous part of the Air Force where they would take new planes from North America, fly them across the Atlantic. This is way before a transatlantic flight was like easy. And then give them to the Allies in North Africa to replace the planes that had been shot down. He made seven successful trips. On the last trip, there was an accident. All the crew was killed outside the capital of Ghana. The family, of course, has never been to the grave. The military found me somehow through the internet, and they said, do you know the family? I said, of course, he's a huge part of the book. The family sent nine pebbles and a kippa from their cottage in Winnipeg with these military, the Canadian military. They went to the cemetery, and they did a service for Sam Donan last year. And luckily, one of the people who was on the trip, that's Shane Donan, who was the nephew who was uh, named after him, was so moved that this happened because these are the pebbles from home, there's the Yorktide candle they sent, and an Israeli officer happened to be in this group and said Kaddish in Ghana for this family and gave them closure. Now, I want you guys to do this as well. And if you can't go, then at least ask your synagogues June the 6th, Thursday, to say Kaddish for D-Day. On my website is a list of 70 names, including George's, of the boys who are buried in Normandy, because there's 70 of them. Read their names, remember them, ask your rabbis to do it. Go to my website, I'll help you. In conclusion, I want to ask you, what do you think the legacy of these brave Canadian fighters, the great generation, is today? Well. Canada became more accepting of Jews after they came back because they fought side by side in the slit trenches and they fought and died together. And when they came home, institutions, politics, life opened up for Jews. But there is still work to be done and we can start tonight. First of all, Veterans Affairs Canada has never recognized the contribution of Canada's Jews to Canadian military history. This is their website. There's stories about black Canadians, Chinese Canadians, China, uh, um, indigenous veterans, hockey players. 17,000 Canadian Jews went, 40% of the eligible Jewish men, and there's never been any recognition on the website of Veterans Affairs. I've been working very hard for the last few years to try to change that. They just lost their minister, Jody Wilson-Raybould, remember? Uh, <laughs> with that SNC scandal, so I don't know what's happening. They did say they were gonna use my book as a basis for a web exhibit. I'm waiting now, it's two and a half years. And the most important legacy for these veterans who fought in Normandy and in um, Ortona and in Italy and in Hong Kong and everywhere is because today they say, what did we fight for? The world has gone crazy again. Nobody remembers why we went to stop fascism and hatred and bigotry. The world hasn't learned anything. Now we have synagogue shootings and synagogue bombings and church burnings and in Sri Lanka and, and the mosque bombings and 2,000 incidents of anti-Semitism that was just released by B'nai B'rith right here in Canada. And the veterans are really worried about this. And they're telling me, don't be a bystander. It's happening again. If you see something, do something, say something, stop it. And I want to close with the words of Willie Rosenthal, who was a journalist from Montreal, a YMHA member, who was an artilleryman in Sicily. And it's very fitting and haunting because of what he wrote then is very applicable today. Before he went to Sicily, he wrote home to his family on Hutchison Street, anyone from Montreal will know where that is, and he told them why he was going and what was at stake. And I want to read it to you now. And his brother on the left has um, become very uh, active in, in, in also spreading these words. Ready? 
And when the air is once again clear from the smoky dust of fire, and when the blood of the dead and wounded is dry and the stench of the bodies is pure, the men who are alive after victory is achieved with God's aid will return, for they the dead shall not have fallen in vain. Not in a world where our holy sanctuaries are safe and unmolested, and in a world where organizations, institutions of culture and learning and education are respected and upheld and supported. No price is too great to pay. No life is too precious to enforce our beliefs and our ideals. We need to ensure that today's generation, the veterans' great-grandchildren and grandchildren who are here know where they came from and what torch has been passed to us today. Some of you might know that um, I come from a family of community leaders. My grandfather, Judge Abe Leaf, was a member here at Bed Sedek, and his motto was, we have to pay our rent. I am very grateful to the Jewish veterans and their families and all of you who have permitted me to pay my rent starting this journey eight years ago and to do the work on their behalf and on behalf of Canada's Jewish community. Thank you very much. I have to rewrite my speech now because I just clicked into my head as I was sitting down that I knew I had heard your name before because I knew that you've spent a lot of time in a place next to the Holocaust Center, which I'm very involved with, <laughs> called the Ontario Jewish Archives. And your research is unbelievable. And on behalf of myself, Federation, the Foundation, everybody in this room, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you so much. Really 